Hey, Seth, I know you were excited about this case. You've brought it up a couple of different times. Are you ready for it now? I am ready. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this case. Um, first, the technology. Uh, the technology that we're talking about, uh, mainly what the attackers are interested in is social media accounts and specific social media accounts, ones with very desirable handles. And um, if you're not really into social media, don't worry. I will tell you that the very desirable handles tend to be things like very short handles. So um, like for instance, my, I'm Keith Jones, I might wanna look for the KJ handle, you know, that'd be very desirable. And I imagine everybody else out there too wants the KJ handle. Um, but that's the desirable thing that the attackers are going after in the series of attacks that we're gonna talk about. So the crime, uh, in this case, most of the crime is going to be swatting. And what swatting is, is when somebody calls in a threat of some sort in order to get emergency services sent to a house that's not theirs. So if they have some kind of enemy online, they might say, oh, Bob, my enemy, um, I'm going to use a, um, a service online to um, basically anonymize my phone number. And I will call in and say, you know, I have an active shooter. And because of that, they're going to send out police, ambulances, fire trucks, and all sorts of stuff to an address, Bob, who's probably unsuspecting. And then all of a sudden, police show up at their door and he was wondering why. So that's going to be most of the crime that we talk about in here. And like I promised in episode one, we're going to talk a little bit about sim swapping and we're not going to get real deep into it because we talked a couple hours on it in episode one but you're going to see when a certain tactic doesn't work the first time around what they do is they then um, go ahead and sim swap in order to get these uh, social media accounts that we talked about so here the criminal was essentially a young man uh, from tennessee uh, the victims were actually individuals all over the united states so fairly broad here, and we'll get into some details when we do the details of the case uh, about who our victims were specifically. Yeah, and it's important to note the victims had that desirable, those very desirable handles, yeah. the yeah. Um, social media account handles that we talked about earlier. So they're very specific victims. Now, the cl clincher in this case, um, I try to pick cases that have something really interesting in them. So here's the things I found really interesting about this case. One is this is a case where well, when people think of computer crime, they think, well, some money got lost or some computer data got corrupted or whatever. No harm, no foul. We, you know, we reset things or we don't, we, um, you know, the credit card company covers it and pays for it. No harm, no foul. We're good. And that's not the case here because now we're looking at a case where virtual harm is going to cross over to physical harm, which actually leads to a death in this case. Yeah, and this is an important point. This comes up often when you look at the basics or rudimentary studies regarding uh, you know, computer-related crimes. And one of the things any teacher or any textbook will tell you is computer crimes, you know, for whatever reason, uh, accurately or not, have a reputation for being more of a victimless crime because it's all numbers and it's computers and it's not, you know, the same thing as somebody, you know, breaking into a door to steal a VCR or something. So we, we thought this case was very interesting because it's a interesting example of actual, frankly, the worst possible, you know, scenario happening uh, as a result of, uh, of a computer related crime. Exactly. And we just talked about SWAT attack where, you know, emergency services get called to a victim address um, by somebody that doesn't live at that address. And one of the clinchers here is, well, how do you defend against a SWAT attack? And I don't have a good answer to this <laughs> because it's kind of out of your hands. It's, you know, it's 911 and emergency services that get the call and it doesn't go anywhere through you. So, um, yeah, it's kind of an open question in my mind. Yeah, it's a really, uh, it's a dangerous, let's call it a trigger uh, that I think hopefully people at the end of this, you know, conversation will have a little more respect for, you know, obviously you want to use that tool when it's appropriate, but uh, when it's used uh, maliciously, it's, it's very scary. Yeah, and what happens when, let's say you've been a victim once against a SWAT attack, and I imagine emergency services put you on some sort of list that says, you know, Keith Jones was a victim of this. What happens when I call in and I say, you know, somebody's having a heart attack? <laughs> Is that going to slow down services because I have to go through another process? I, I don't know the answer to that, but um, to me, that was a pretty interesting 
aspect of this type of attack. Yeah. And then I think we'll get into, I guess, you know, the, um, the why here, why would, um, you know, a serial swatter, you know, want notable Instagram and Twitter usernames so badly. What, what is the value there? I think that's, you know, the, an important component to this case. Yep. Sit back and enjoy episode two of eCrime Bites. Oh, Seth, I tell you what, I actually, I look forward a lot to this weekly or every other week time that we get to record these things because I'm in trouble at home again this week. Again? <laughs> again. Yeah, there's there's a real, real power struggle in the Jones house going on over snacks. Over snacks. See, well, there's a lot to this story, but this week what I'm in trouble for is I ate my... I have two daughters and I gambled wrongly on which daughter's chocolate pancakes were in the fridge because one never finishes her food and the other one always finishes her food. And I ate the one that always finishes her food. And you would have thought that I was tearing the Jones family apart by the very fabric that it was established on. And I mean, there was like, my daughters are still, you know, my, the one daughter that, uh, that doesn't usually eat her food comes to me and says, Oh, you're in trouble. And I, I, was, I was like, come on, Charlotte. I thought it was yours. That's why I ate it. That she looked at me. She's like, you thought it was mine. I'm like, Charlotte, you never eat your snacks. So that's why I always finish your snacks for you. But yeah, it was, it was, um, uh, chocolate pancakes this time, but I've been in so many, I've been in trouble so many times, at least in the past year for just eating the snacks that are my, um, kids at school lunch snacks. You know, because they're in the drawer and I go in there and it, I, it, a lot of times I'll wake up at night very hungry and I'll crash around the kitchen like a bear and I'll <laughs> pick up whatever first snack it is that I can find to quench that hunger so I can go back to bed without waking up past that point of not being able to go back to sleep. So <clears throat> since then, I've learned that my pa my family has, because of this, have left out decoy snacks which are snacks that I'm supposed to, dad's supposed to find and eat that aren't as good as their snacks. So there's a whole like range of snacks in the Jones household now. That are they, are they off brand? Because that would be insulting. They are. They are like, they are. They're, they're like the not so good granola bars and stuff like that. <laughs> that it's just, it, it, I mean, I got some pictures. Look at this. Off brand side. granola bars. Yeah. I got to tell you, I'm looking at this picture and I've never heard. Of any of these brands. Well, one of them looks bars. like, so there's a set of crackers here. And uh, what's the main cracker brand? Kraft? It's similar to Kraft, but it's not Kraft. No, it's Keebler. I mean, it's not bad. And then you got the Mott's, like, um, gummy fruits over on the right-hand side. And you got these Z-Bar proteins on the left. And most notably are these three giant sticky notes. One on the left side that says, no Keith. One in the middle that says, school snacks. And one on the right that says, not dad food. So when I, I look for snacks, this is what I pull out on a daily basis. And you would think it would stop there, but no, no. After I ate the chocolate pancakes this week, these are the sticky notes that I got this week. On the fridge, it says, go back to daycare, you toddler, no Keith zone. <laughs> and then because I ate my younger daughter's cookies, this is uh, another picture from, I don't know, this is probably a month or so ago. Or <laughs> I thought my wife wrote this, but it ended up being my youngest daughter. It says, Keith... If you eat these cookies, I will use your feet as bricks to keep us warm. And I wondered, what did she mean by bricks to keep us warm? And then I just, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to tempt fate, and I'm just going to pretend I didn't even see this. Yeah, you may not want to. She might have a real dark side there where she's lopping feet off and using them to heat the house. I wouldn't want to get into that. Uh, so long, long story made short, it's nice to have this time with you, Seth. So we Likewise. might as well just go ahead and uh, get into our case, huh? All right, so switching over to our case here. We're going to use a lot of initials because some of these victims are, I believe even the first one I think is a minor, um, but we're going to use a lot of initials just not to embarrass the original victims unless um, unless it was used prominently and then we'll, we'll give it to you. So this particular victim one is going to be called KG. 
Got it. So I'll give some details on the victim. But Keith, is it worth kind of starting the conversation with explaining to our audience why somebody would want to um, basically take access or take over somebody's notable um, usernames from social media? Sure. So, for instance, and we're going to talk about specific usernames coming up here, but I'm just going to give you some off the cuff examples that aren't in the story just to give you a flavor. But um, let's say for instance, um, well, myself, like the example I gave you earlier, Keith Jones, I have initials KJ. So let's say there's a Kristen Johnson out there that uses Instagram and it has KJ, but I'm a bad guy and I want the KJ account for myself. So you know, I could go through the steps that we're going to talk about in this case to try to get access to that KJ account. That, that would be one example. Um, another one would be um, one here we're going to see where someone uses a geographical um, handle, like uh, Tennessee, like on Instagram, at Tennessee. You know, there's a lot of people for a lot of different reasons would probably like the at Tennessee Instagram handle. So when we talk about desirable social media accounts. These are the types of things that we're talking about. And it's desirable to different people for different reasons. And typically in these hacker stories, it's the shorter named handles, like the, the ones with the least amount of characters. Right. Understood. So KG lived in Oregon and she started around December, 2019, receiving some phone calls asking her to give up her Instagram handle. Now they didn't list in the court paperwork where her Instagram handle is, but based upon the other ones that we will talk about, I imagine it's pretty short because that's, that tends to be the thing. It's usually two, three, four characters long of something pretty popular that a lot of people want. So call started in December, 2019 and calls and messages started continued through April of 2020. Now, if that's not enough, around the same time, her parents in Stowe, Ohio, so all the way across the country, started receiving deliveries for food that wasn't paid for. So this is the, I guess, cheaper version of the swatting attack, which is send unpaid for food to somebody's house right so this is like a variation of the old let's send 50 pizzas down to so-and-so's house ha 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 let them pay on demand yep and then kg gets a message on uh, december 21st of 2019 says do you and your family want more food just give the account if you don't respond in 30 minutes the food is coming either way so ignore if you choose from a text now number ending in dash zero six two nine nine times in five minutes. So this person really wants the uh, wants this message to get across. And if you wonder what text now is and why I give you the number, so uh, if you want to use text message services from the internet without having an actual phone. You can do that. There are services out there where you there's free services and there's paid for services where you can sign up and you, you're basically given a virtual phone number account and you can make uh, te text messages come from that phone number. Uh, probably one of the most popular services to do this would be Google Voice. So if you have a Google account, you probably have a Google Voice attached to it and don't even know it. Um, I think it's voice.google.com you go to. And then once you have this virtual number, you can call people or you can actually just text from it. So text now is just another service like that Google voice that allows for texting through a virtual number on the internet. And why attackers do this is so it's not directly traceable to their cell phone and all, right. number. So the form if I have a cell phone. Understood. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't have to get like a burner phone to do it or anything else. All you had to do was basically sign up for this account online. And it's kind of like having a, a virtual phone in your hand. All right. So on the same day, December 21st, 19, 
gets another message. Text me here when you want it to stop. And it's from the text now 0629 number. All right. So there wasn't much information about what happened at that point. I think KG ignored this person because in March 7th of the next year, 2020, there was a message to KG that says, going to need the Instagram account or I will continue to SWAT and harass you and your family. And SWAT being what we talked about earlier with sending emergency services to a victim's address. So let's pause there. Before we get any further into it, Keith, if this happened to you as an expert, what, what would you have done at this point? Would you have contacted law enforcement? So if I was getting these type of messages, I think I probably would have. Um, meaning I, I would have I would let them know this information that's coming across, especially if I haven't been swatted and I'm being threatened with a SWAT. So that way, if there's some kind of list or something that I need to be on, that they know that, you know, if a weird call comes from purportedly my address, they need to think that it might not be me making that phone call. Does that make sense? How yeah, about you? I mean, I, I, I certainly would have contacted law enforcement. I don't know the expectations on what they would have done. I think different jurisdictions work differently. Um, you know, and I'm not sure the amount that issue here for delivered food would have amounted enough to a serious enough crime to, you know, warrant, um, you know, certainly not a federal investigation, but it's just an interesting question because, you know, I think, you know, here the victim ignored it um, and it ended up working out not so great. Yeah. And there would have been things that law enforcement could have probably have done, like go and figure out what this text now number is. If the yeah. person behind it was sloppy, maybe they logged in with an address that is traceable to them rather than, you know, bouncing it out of country or something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I do feel like in the world of computer forensics, people either way overestimate what can be done or way underestimate what can be done. Yeah. No kidding. You know, you, you take that picture and you zoom in and blow it up infinitely, right? Right, right, yeah. All right. So now we're talking about April 13th, 2020. KG's parents in Ohio were swatted. So like we talked about, again, swatting is your police and emergency are going to show up to your house, either thinking that there's an active shooter or someone's having a heart attack or there's a fire or something. And that's hence the name SWAT team. And that's why it's called swatting. Um, in this particular case, I guess if you're going to SWAT somebody, this is probably the least worst, which is it's just a residential house fire with people trapped inside. Um, some of these other swatting call-ins are a lot worse where there's active shooters. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's enough to get pretty much all emergency services sent to your house. So the next day, um, someone then posted KG's parents' names and addresses to a Discord chat server. We did, we talked a little bit about Discord in our first episode, which is just a um, chat server or service on the Internet that uh, people come together and talk about different subjects. So sometimes they come together for illicit purposes like this. And in this particular case, someone posted KG's parents' names and addresses to a chat server. Now, we'll talk more about it in future episodes, but the te the techie term to this is doxing. You're basically, you're taking that person's documentation and you're posting it on online. So when they took their names and addresses and they put it on a, a chat server like this, it's called their doxing KG's parents. All right. And then later you see the swatter sent a message to KG that says, did your parents enjoy the fire trucks along with, I plan on killing your parents next. If you do not hand the username on Instagram over to me from a different text now number now ending in five, two, six, five. So the other one started with, let me see, let me look back. The other one was zero six two nine, and now we're looking at a five two six five. So I just know we're clear: sending a threat, a death threat through electronic means, is a federal crime. Just so we're clear. So this, at that point, should have been reported to law enforcement. Yeah, and even even if you want to go rogue and not <laughs> send it to law enforcement, and you say, "Oh, I want to block this number," well. As we're telling you, they're changing the numbers. Right. As Clearly, it goes that's along. going to be so, an ineffectual uh, defense against you know um, 
that kind of uh, texting situation for sure. Yep. So if we, we blocked the 06 number that was texting us earlier, now this 5265 number is now getting through and saying that they're going to kill our parents. It's also worth noting that's a pretty big escalation from sending some food to somebody's house and like a lightweight form of swatting uh, to threatening death. Um, that, that I feel was a, a pretty aggressive escalation. Yeah. Yes. I feel like the, uh, the swatter has anger issues. <laughs> All right. So, um, not only did the swatter send messages to KG, but they also sent messages to KG's parents. It says, Hey, tell your son slash daughter KG, because I, I guess the attacker doesn't know what gender KG is to give me the Instagram handle. And then it, whatever it is, it's redacted and all the harassment to you and your wife will stop. So I'll go through victim number two here. So victim number two, uh, we actually have her name because uh, she was not a minor. Her name was Valerie DeZono. I'm maybe mispronouncing her last name. Uh, yeah, we can make any uh, of the VD jokes if we'd like to. Um, she received multiple unsolicited offers to buy her uh, VD you know, social media account. She ignored them. I should point out, I should point out, it's literally VD. Like, that's the initials, <laughs> VD. So Super valuable. <laughs> so, so I don't know why people would want it, but they do. It's like the example I gave with KJ with my initials, but it's it's literally VD. So that's yeah. why people want it. It's because it's so short like that. I'm sure the Valtrex company was a prime suspect in, uh, in this instance. <laughs> um, so... Uh, Valerie VD and her family members started receiving unordered pizza deliveries at all hours. So we've seen that before. So Valerie DeZona was a victim of SIM swapping. We learned about that in episode one, essentially allow somebody to take over somebody's phone. And she also was a victim of swatting. In this case, a bomb threat was then called into Valerie's house. So we have some notes from the court documents here that go into some detail. DeZono said that the attacker created an account on Grindr, which is a location-based social networking and dating app for the gay, bi, trans, and queer community, and has set up a rendezvous at her address with an unsuspecting Grindr user who was instructed to, quote, waltz into her home as if he was invited, unquote. This gentleman was sent to my home thinking someone was there and he was given instructions to walk into my home, DeZona, the victim, said. So pretty scary stuff, right? I mean, if you put yourself in her position and somebody just walks into your house uh, and mentions that they're from Grindr, it might um, throw you for quite a loop. Absolutely. Could have been a lot, lot worse. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so the third victim goes by the initials of K SKK, and SKK is a New York resident. Around August of 2019, so same time frame we're talking about with these other victims, started receiving phone calls, unordered food deliveries, etc., for ownership of an Instagram account. Uh, we don't have what the Instagram account is in here, but if I recall correctly from the court documents, it was a short uh, handle, like all the other ones that we've been talking about. Um, all it said in here was that the attackers or attacker or attackers uh, gained unauthorized access to SKK's Instagram account. It didn't say how, and it didn't say that, that SKK gave it over. So I'm assuming another SIM swapping attack probably happened in order for there to be unauthorized access to Instagram. Okay. If we jump to a fourth victim, now this one, his name is Shane Glass, and Shane is a Virginia resident. So it's the same time frame as the other three victims between August 2019 and March 2020. Started receiving text messages, phone calls, unordered food deliveries. And it was reported that Shane was also a victim of SIM swap attack, which is what we talked about in episode one. Now, um, it was reported that the attacker did gain unauthorized access to the Instagram account. So... I would say that the fact that they said that Shane victim was probably also a victim of sim swap attack because the methodologies tend to be the same uh, across the same type of crime like this. But it's worth noting that the first victim from what we've seen did not actually have the Instagram or social media account taken over. Right. But the other the next three victims did. 
Yeah, the first one was KG, and that was the one with the parents that got swatted. Um, right. Yeah, we don't have any evidence of that, of, of, of a takeover of that one that I can recall. Yes, I'm wondering if, as a matter of course, the the uh, the perps here, you know, try to get smarter and realize they need like a harder process to uh, to take over those accounts and ultimately ended up using this uh, sin swapping versus just making threats. Yeah. Maybe it started with unordered food deliveries and yeah. <laughs> cranked up to swatting and then it cr you know cranked up to uh, sim swapping. Indeed. So the fifth victim, we have just a little bit about information about this person. Um, we don't even have a gender. We just have the initials SC and it was Michigan resident. And around the same time frame in November 2019, started receiving unordered food deliveries. And that's all they said. Um, it didn't say swatting or Instagram accounts or anything else, but it was attributed to the same attacker. So I put yep. it in here because now we're getting to the pinnacle of our story, which is victim number six. So victim number six was Mark Herring. We have a picture here of a older gentleman with a uh, fuzzy white beard. Looks like a jovial dude. He was 60 years old in 2020. He lived in Bethpage, Tennessee. He's a grandfather a known, quote, computer guy, and he would register social media handles for his family and friends just to be nice. Um, also, anytime there was a new baby, he would do that. He owned the, quote, at Tennessee, unquote, Twitter handle. And in April of 2020, Mark began receiving messages asking him to give up his at Tennessee Twitter handle. Mark ignored them. Uh, unordered food deliveries to Mark's house with cash due on delivery was also a factor in this crime. Yep. And guess what the next thing is that Mark has happened to him, Seth? If Let me guess. We, we, Something we, related to keep... sim swapping. No, nope, nope, nope. If we if we follow the ratchet up, we had the unordered food, what would be the next one? The next one would be swatting, right? Oh yeah, fire trucks or emergency services. Excuse me. Yes. So the next thing Mark knows, there are police lining his street. And when he goes out onto the porch, he is told to put his hands up and come to the street. So police are there over a call of a reported shooting. So that's really interesting, especially given the time frame here uh, where tensions were super hot, you know, regarding um, police activity across the country. Um, Mark was unable to open the latch on his fence. He was instructed to, quote, crawl over it with his hands in the air. And Mark, our victim, replied, I'm a 60 year old fat man and I can't do that, unquote. Mark offered to crawl under the fence, and he does so. And as soon as Mark stood up, he collapsed from a heart attack, and he died at the hospital a little while later. So what sounded like, frankly, an amusing story ended up to being extremely not funny at all. Yeah, exactly. And at this point, we don't have the name of the person doing all this. You know, we have a person that's ratcheting up from uh, owner, unordered food deliveries to swatting to sim swapping and taking unauthorized access to accounts, but we don't have anybody to place on those crimes. So it could be anybody. And um, there was an arrest made, but it didn't, the court documents didn't tell me exactly how they found this person. So if I had to guess, what I think happened is they probably looked at some of these accounts, like the text now accounts and, Anywhere else he had to log in in order to do communications with these people and probably linked it to an IP address. And we talked about what an IP address is in episode one, but it's just a numerical address. It's like a house address for your computer in a way. It's just a, a number. And if I had to guess, I would say the police probably linked those accounts that were making the threatening statements to an IP address or phone number or something like that and then found this person. So at some point there was an arrest made. Um, so in the era of these crimes, which was around 2018 through 2020, there was an individual named Shane Soderman. He was 17 to 19 years old in that time frame of 2018 to 2000, 2020. Shane also lived in Lauderdale, County, Tennessee. So he was in the vicinity of uh, Mark Herring. And it would make sense that somebody would like this would probably want a Tennessee Twitter handle if he lives in Tennessee. I mean, it's like 
how how valuable is it? It's only valuable to the person that wants it. So maybe he really wanted Tennessee because he lived there. But is um, there a virtual? I'm going to pause you, Keith. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Is there like um, you know, in the law, where, you know, we're learning about like you know, the very burgeoning economic world of um, the metaverse, right? You know, so the idea that, you know, the, the, I would say the age old, it's not age old. The legal question that's come up is if, if I buy property in a game and then somebody hacks my account, did I lose anything? Even though I might have actually spent real money to buy that property, you know, how does that work? And how do you prove it that you ever owned it? And, you know, you try explaining logging to people. Um, you know, I'm just wondering if that would be kind of the MO for why somebody would ultimately want to steal, uh, you know, an account handle name is at some point. You know, is it valuable to the point that it could actually generate value in the real world? Possibly. Um, I mean, these smaller handles are things that people remember or will remember to go to. And um, and or if they already have a bunch of followers like we will see in, uh, in I don't know if it's the next episode, but it's coming up where um, some of these accounts are taken over, the social media accounts are taken over. And because they have a bunch of followers, then they use it to, you know, promote cryptocurrency or Viagra or something, some other reason, you know, then, then that was purposely built for, but they basically, because they take ownership of it, are then able to use it for nefarious purposes too. Yeah. I was thinking more like if the state of Tennessee was like, we want to have a social media account, we'd love it to be on Instagram at Tennessee. It's already used. We'll pay that guy a thousand bucks to, you know, give us that handle. Cause we don't want to go with the real Tennessee or something like that. I don't know. I'm just thinking, I'm thinking out loud here. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that happens all the time. I mean, if you, if someone jumps on a handle or a domain or something like that, that somebody wants, it's, um, it's usually, how much are you willing to pay for it? Yeah. Yeah. So Shane, um, after all this, so after um, the police figured out that it was Shane and um, they arrested him and, you know, showed him that the evidence that they had, and I can only imagine these hacked accounts and so forth probably got traced back to him through some kind of IP address or so forth. Um, it, he decided to plea guilty. So March 22, 2021, so about a year-ish after the deaths and so forth that we talked about, uh, he pleaded guilty. And he admitted to harassing people like Mark Herring, the person that died, and uh, posting their names and addresses on Discord servers. Servers. He also said there was a co-conspirator, a miner in the UK, that called in the SWAT. Um, when I did research trying to figure out how this per anything about this extra person, there really wasn't much in the court records because it was a foreign person that, um, you know, wasn't here. So it's not like they had search warrants or anything else from him. So it was just mentioned in his plea agreement that he worked with somebody and that was that. So there's more than one person involved behind this, but Shane got caught. But I would argue that the person who actually made the calls executing the swatting is just as culpable. It's like, you know, if you hire a hitman, you know, obviously the person who paid the money to the hitman is culpable, but the hitman himself or herself is, you know, literally the person pulling the trigger, right? So if you're the one who's actually executing on a, on a, on a SWAT, I would, I would argue legally that is almost as bad, if not worse. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think the problem here is when you have A, a minor, and B, somebody in the UK, what can the US do about yeah, that? Yeah, there's all kinds of jurisdictional issues and you know statutory issues regarding age. It's, it's messy, um, and I think that's why the court documents are still not complete on this uh, or sealed. Yeah, so when I was doing the research of the court documents, I found something that was really kind of funny slash interesting. So Shane violated his pretrial release on April 9th, 2021. And I wondered why. So I started digging into the paperwork and I found out that he logged into the quote unquote free the soldiers account. His group set up to harass people for their ha handles. So he's basically doing the, he's going back and using the same accounts that he was using before when he was committing his crimes while it's pre-trial. Yeah. I mean, a part of me wonders if there's a deeper conspiracy here that was un not uncovered here, right? Why would a 19-year-old kid 
go on such a bender and, and moreover continue to do it while he's under um you know in try i guess pre-trial or you know clearly has major major legal consequences for his actions if there wasn't a major payoff or reason to it i don't even buy that he was quote addicted to it which is what he claimed due to some medical mental disorders including bipolar disorder i i i have to put on my my conspiracy theory hat and think that there was a, a major issue reason why he would continue to on the call you know to um you know to 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 swat people and you know basically be a major major um on, let me repeat that be so interested in gathering uh unlawfully gained instagram and social media handles i still want to really trigger what to what end yeah it, it, it's got to be in my mind when i read all this research it's got to be either a monetary incentive so somebody's paying him possibly for these accounts and that's why he's you know he's basically the muscle to get the accounts or maybe there's like some ego thing where he just wants these you know, he just just wants the accounts i mean it's just important to him and he wants the accounts so um those were the only two big motivations that i could think of he you know his in, in court he said that you know, he had psychiatric conditions, including uh, bipolar disorder to do this. And the court documents noted that there was lots of crying. And then his mom went up there and confirmed he yeah, had bipolar and everything and begged the court for mercy. Um, but it just, it just, it seems like not the right defense for what he did. Like this doesn't this is a very angry crime that he did. You know what I'm saying? Well, it is. And it's, it's, um, you know, the fact that somebody died from it, it, it was one of those, like you could argue it's, you know, wasn't the reason, you know, in the legal term, it wasn't reasonably foreseeable, but, uh, and maybe that's true. I don't know, you know, but the, the um, it, it's a real awful crime in that it's hard to pinpoint, you know, where on the spectrum of criminality it lies. Right. So, you know, it's not a new thing to call in, food for somebody and have someone else pay for it right but to do it as a nuisance to the point where you're basically extorting somebody and that is extortion um you know it is interesting and that's why i feel like there's clearly more to this story that was not uncovered or at least for purposes and maybe we'll come back to it in a later episode um you know uh, because i do think there's clearly something behind why would somebody gather illegally gained um identities online you know in terms of related to social media but for some kind of other monetary gain, ultimately a monetary gain. And uh, I think we're going to try to revisit this because I find this to be, you know, a fascinating story. Because, I mean, you could think about it you're like, OK, so basically somebody was doing awful things that really just made him like a professional asshole um, <laughs> rather than a criminal, even though the acts were, in fact, criminal. But, you know, if you're ruining people's lives or making their lives a nuisance, you know, to gain money, that's extortion. And that is a crime. But, I, I, you know, we don't have any evidence from the court documents as to what his ultimate goal here was other than just to obtain these these Instagram handles. Yeah. And the whole I have bipolar disorder and that's why I did it and so forth. It just seems like it just seems like not the right defense for this, because later on, prosecutors then played in court a recording of a phone call from Sonderman to a female acquaintance that he wiped his mobile phone two days before investigators served another search warrant on his home. So it's like, he knows what he's doing. It's for sure. It, I mean, generally somebody will bring up a psychiatric or medical disorder as a legit defense saying they were not in control of their actions. Um, but that'd be a, a tough, a tough argument to make if somebody, you know, was not only, you know, able to execute on such a thing technically, but then apparently brag about it as well. Well, since he was visiting all the forums and stuff for the handles that he wasn't supposed to be visiting pre-trial, um, they then decided to detain him because he wasn't following his pre-trial release. And so then he heads towards sentencing and let's look at what he has for sentencing. So, so I'll hit this one. So sure. the plea agree, there was a plea agreement here. Uh, and it was really under um, uh, U.S. Code 371, uh, conspiracy to engage in using the Internet 
to make false reports. So there's your, your swatting. So there is a law, a law bit on that. Uh, and then additional send threatening and or harassing messages and perpetuate hoaxes, which is accurate. I'm surprised they didn't go with extortion here, though, um, because I think that was and maybe the reason they couldn't get the extortion claim um, or, or I guess offense rather was they had an uh, inability to tie it back to any monetary gain uh, in reality or, 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 or uh, potentially. But I find that to be a very, you know, the lack of that offense to be the most interesting part of this. Well, usually what I see with the pleas is they, not in this case, I'm just saying generally when I do research for these these cases for this podcast, is you see the government will throw a ton of counts at them and then you'll see them plea it to like one or two of them and then they'll sentence them on that. And I, in this one, just seeing one count in there, they may have, um, you know, go back to the court document. I, I believe there's other counts in there. There may have been counts that were just dismissed because he decided I'm going to plead to this one. And that was just good enough. You know what I'm saying? Do we have information, Keith, that there was any um, civil um, claims uh, against the the, uh, the death of uh, uh, at Tennessee? Not in this case. I do remember a civil case, but I think it's in one of our upcoming episodes. Understood. I meant for this specific matter, um, you know, was there a separate sim- civil um claim filed against uh mr sonderman or his family not that i i'm not saying that there wasn't but not that i read all right so this is where things get real interesting soderman's sentencing so the recommended sentence for what he plead to was 27 to 33 months in prison which is around three ish years two to three ish years a little over two years to three ish years now Soderman got the max for this case. <laughs> he got five years in prison with three years supervised release. And his judge, Judge Norris, says, and I'm quote unquote this, he says, uh, he or she says, although it may seem inadequate, the law is the law, Norris said. The harm it caused, the death and destruction, it's almost unspeakable. This is not like cases where we frequently have that involve guns and carjacking and drugs. This is a whole different level of insidious criminal behavior here. And I kind of, I have to agree. I mean, swatting somebody to the point where they die is, that's pretty bad. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it's the swatting and the resulting death. Again, I'm not sure that was reasonably anticipated that the cops would have, you know, reacted that way because the latch didn't open. And then the 60 year old man decided to not climb over, but under a fence, which would cause a heart attack. Although you take your victims as you find them. I find the insidious nature of it more about, you know, for such a simple uh, on its face, low level thing to steal. Right. Um, In terms of a Twitter handle and, you know, the escalation of sending food to someone's house and then fire trucks and then threatening to kill them or threatening to kill one's parents. Rather, that is a level of insidious criminal behavior that is scary. Um, and, you know, the fact is, it's it's beyond just, like I said, being a bit of a professional asshole. Uh, you know, these are illegal, but clearly the, the level of criminality doesn't, I think, match, you know, what the criminal offense um, time served is. One could argue, I mean, if somebody's going to prison for 20 years for selling marijuana, well, I guess that's legal now in many states, but something along those lines and gets two years uh, plus three years of release here, uh, I think there needs to be a kind of a recalibration of computer crimes. Yeah. So right. let's go through some the six concluding points here, Jones. Let's split them. Sure um, I'll start with the first three because the first one's super funny. Um, apparently, the account handle VD is more popular and valuable than we had thought. Yeah. Um, yeah. Computer crime can get physical with swatting, right? So we're going to have other cases we look at in future episodes where you know things are actually even more escalated than this, even worse. And then uh, sim swapping, which, again, we mentioned in episode one, was used in this case when threatening did not work. So it was an escalation. Yeah. And the fourth point is the max sentence for this type of case I thought was very low. You know, five years recommended was under three years. It seemed even for computer crime cases, it seemed very, very low. Um, And then I thought for the the fifth point is how do you defend against a SWAT attack? We talked about this at the beginning. It's very difficult. And I think I, a point you brought up in earlier in the podcast, Seth, where you said, 
what would you do? And I guess if you not notify the authorities that someone's threatening you, that they're going to SWAT you, that's a good time to defend as best as you can against a SWAT attack by saying, hey, I'm being threatened against a SWAT attack. And the authorities can, you know, I imagine they have some kind of operating procedure that they will go through for victims of this type of crime. You know, and it's it ties to me like so one thing you could do is you can get a new phone. But anybody who's ever had to go, you know, get a new cell phone number and then tell all your business, personal family contacts, hey, this is my new number now. I mean, that's it's a huge pain. Right. I mean, I remember when it was a big deal when you could keep your phone number when you change services and what a what a pleasure that was. So this is kind of like the inverse of that. So it gets to my point. I've said a few times now, but I'm going to stick with it. Beyond the criminality here, it's such an asshole thing to do to, to somebody to, you know, attack them via their mobile phone. We all are so attached to it as a means of communicating with everything, right? You know, via work, friends, family, emails, text. We all are really attached to our phones for a lot of reasons. So to put that, you know, to the point where people use it against you as a weapon is is a scary proposition. I don't think if, if anything I've learned from this case is as a society, we're not really equipped to handle that we don't have any real defenses to it right i mean it's it's a it's a really scary proposition i will yeah. say as a as a takeaway you know I, if you are ever you know swatted um i would involve the police right away i think even if it's not a, a physical threat like this one escalated to uh just so they have something to work off of and they may not be able to solve your problem right away but they certainly will open a case for it yeah agreed i would i'd at least notify law enforcement that you've been threatened over a SWAT yeah. or threatened using a SWAT. Um, and then the last bullet point, which is uh, it's a bad idea to ask any 60 year old to climb over or under a fence. So <laughs> why, why that? I don't know. It seems like that could have been handled a little better than just like you have to climb over a fence or you have, <laughs> or even, yes, it's okay for you to climb under the fence. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I won't get into the details of how the cops might have handled that one differently. But to be fair, we weren't there. Um, you know, uh, law enforcement has uh, several stresses, so that'll be a separate conversation. But, you know, back to point five about defending against a SWAT attack. We have a bullet point here that we didn't mention that I do want to mention is it's kind of scary that you don't want to get into a situation where in your local community um, you're known as uh, somebody, you know, that was receiving emergency services whether they were reasonable or not so if if you actually have a heart attack or god forbid need emergency services and your town you live in is like oh no no th not those people that's always uh you know a bullshit thing that's scary um yeah it's like it's a cry wolf syndrome yeah i mean that's a real you know reasonable anticipated consequence of 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 being swatted is now you know you may not get the services you need when you need them yeah they might be delayed who knows for sure well, that comes to the conclusion of our story. I hope you enjoyed it. It was, uh, you know, we try to give you something that maybe you haven't heard of. And I try to pick something interesting. And I figured physical harm and death was a pretty interesting topic to hit with our second episode. So what do you think about it, Seth? Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping uh, I certainly have been thinking a lot more about you know, computer crimes really need to be reevaluated in terms of the impact it can have on society. And so, you know, I'm glad that you picked this one, uh, Keith, where, you know, uh, awful as it was, the fact that, you know, there are real consequences. People can die here, you know, in a, maybe an unreasonably foreseeable um, set of circumstances, but still happened. And, you know, the, the old law of you take your victims as you find them does apply here. It's also interesting to me that um, the, the the attacker here, the perpetrator, was such a young person, um, you know, fairly sophisticated in, you know, in the method of attack. Right. I mean, you know, I don't think I, I don't think it's unheard of for a 17 year old to order pizzas for somebody, but to have that escalate to fire trucks and then ultimately to sim swapping with a uh, death threat to your parents in between is insidious. That's a huge jump. That's not a prank. And, um, you know, clearly needs to be taken seriously. So I, I just hope people, if we get anything out of the E-Crime Bites uh, podcast series, is that computer crimes are scary in that, you know, it doesn't take a ton of sophistication to commit them, but it can have extreme consequences. Yeah, they come in a lot of different forms, too. You're, you're, you'll see over the next few episodes that I pick very, very different types of attacks 
and they all involve computers in some way, and they're all hopefully interesting to listen to. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for a great episode, and uh, you know you can reach out to us on our website www.ecrimebites.com. You can hit us up on Twitter at uh, ecrimebites, um, Mastodon, https uh, infosec.exchange backslash at ecrimebites, Facebook. Uh, www.facebook.com slash ecrimebytes and email uh, ecrimebytes at gmail.com so uh, Keith you want to take us home? Sure and if you don't remember any of those if you just go to our website www.ecrimebytes.com I try to put all the links up at the top for you as so, bytes with a Y yep computer computer spelling so e-c-r-i-m-e b-y-t-e-s dot com Thanks for listening, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you on episode three.